three, two, we are live. <clears throat> This is 2OF Entertainment. Yeah, we're back. <laughs> so, Who knew? Summer is kicking along yet, and we're still. I know. Summer. We're back. We're yeah. back. Well, today we have an interesting a, show. You're going to do it. You have a symposium talk. I don't even know what that word. Yes. word. Well, symposium's not like the symphony. It's a symposium. People do get them confused <clears throat> a little bit, but we'll talk about um, uh, a sculpture symposium that actually I was involved in, and we're going to bring in one of our other members of our group that involved in the same thing and uh, mm -hmm. we're going to show some sculpture that was built over the last two weeks cool. um, in a community and how the community came together to help sponsor and support what we're doing and it's a young city and I don't know we'll just we'll bring Kevin in and uh, mm -hmm. Kevin Quinlan will, will join us and then we'll, Here's Kevin. we'll Kevin. then have a good shot this is well above my pay grade so you guys have a great show I'll see you at the end <laughs> <laughs> hey, Greg, Roger. Wish we had a page. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Kevin. Good morning, Paul. Yeah. So it's uh, a relaxing day to get the van unpacked and get everything undone, put away. Oh, yes. And it was a grand travail, a big work. <laughs> I had to unpack it twice. I know. It just it, it seems to be, it, you know, the setup is like multiple trips to get everything there you build stuff and so we're going to talk a little bit about the symposium the sculpture symposium that our prairie sculptors have put on you and i are both members and uh our membership a portion of our membership group uh, participated in this um it was sculptors in the park um can you tell us a little bit about how that came about like you know I mean, we're, this has been an ongoing thing for quite a while to get it to go Well, a sculpture symposium, first we should explain what a symposium is, I think. Symposium comes from the Latin word symposia, which simply means the exchange of ideas. I think Aristotle and Plato talked about having symposiums, and they were just sitting around exchanging ideas. And that's, that's what we do in a sculpture symposium. Uh, we work together uh, as a group but each of us works on our own individual pieces and we can work a little larger than normal because if you need somebody to help you lift something or move something or even look at it and tell you what's not working well you have the uh, group of artists all around you ready to help yeah i think that and also being able to work larger and outdoors and Uh, I think with our stuff anyway, in a sculpture sense, uh, we can work on a larger, larger format. And uh, yeah. I think the other thing is you're realizing that we're, we're going to go through and show some of the sculpture that we worked on. It's uh, a very eclectic group. I mean, I don't think any one person creates sculpture the same way in, in our in our association that we have at the Prairie Sculptors. And uh, I, I think when we uh i think this this symposia that we had has taken quite a while to put together i mean it was uh, i think i think you said about seven years i think you know from the to get the community involved and in wanting something in their community can you tell us a little bit about the aspirations of Mar uh, martinsville now martinsville is a young city just north of saskatoon about 15 minutes and uh They have great vision. I mean, there's a great little community and it's growing fast and it's energized. Um, what do they feel they're going to get for some public displayed art in their community? Well, um, with Martinsville, I think they're looking to bring uh, a little bit of art into their community because as a, a young city, They really don't have much outside in terms of public art. There are a few pieces here and there, but they wanted to expand their collection. And Prairie Sculptors Association tries to have uh, a sculpture symposium 
every two years ideally but that doesn't always work out now about eight years ago we were set up in north battleford having a very successful symposium there and people from martinsville from council came out to that symposium looked and saw what we were doing and said we have to do this in martinsville which of course is music to the ears of prairie sculptors people because we're always looking for a host community Unfortunately, we were committed at that time. I guess fortunately, unfortunately, I'm not sure what to say. We were committed to Manitou Beach, and we were going to Manitou Beach and having a sculpture symposium there. And that was great. They had a good facility. It was right by the lake, so you could work and work and get really hot and then go for a swim and go back to work. So Manitou Beach was great. And we did symposia there every two years, and it ended up six years later, we still had not gone to Martinsville. So Martinsville, uh, people on council started to talk to me again and say, when are we going to do the symposium? So last year, I wrote up a little proposal on uh, you know what we could do uh, for the community and what the community uh, could do for us and how we could partner on a symposium so with a lot of meetings and a lot of discussion and a lot of probably voting on their part uh martinsville uh, uh came through and said yes they would like to partner uh on the symposium they provided some funding for us because of course you big sculptures like this and taking two weeks out of your life and working every day that takes a little bit of funding and martinsville provided that and we provided the sculptures i'm going to get stephen to start up our first image here and we'll uh there's a graphic and so they they worked on martinsville actually put the graphics together they said they wanted to control the brand um and we stepped back and said perfect uh <laughs> we didn't have to do we did our social media promotions and things and uh we talked you know regularly with people so here's here's kind of the opening gate um to our community that we had created over two weeks um uh, yeah they provided you know they provided uh structured tents in a in a compounded area that was secured uh with a fence and we had great sponsors. I mean, there was amazing sponsors. Um, we had Liquid Air, who who gave uh, a lot of the welders uh, the tools that they needed to do the welding and grinding with, and uh, go through. A, I think they're all on the sign there. Um, Martinsville themselves were the spawn one of the big sponsors, and realizing that. Uh, these things take a lot of effort. I mean, to to coordinate this thing, um, I think our compound, we actually had a large generator brought in. Um, you always find out these things, there's always a little hiccup. And we started a little bit late. Um, part of it was we had some generators that were um, provided and uh, they didn't just didn't provide enough power that we needed for our uh, welders and things that are people that were using so they stepped up to the plate and got us a big one great big monster that uh, provided power for everything <laughs> it was amazing so it's great when you work with a uh, community that uh, really are committed to a, a lot of the things uh, that we needed to produce these products with now this this is kind of uh, the end of the show thing this is I guess I call it the community dream this is that's what we were just talking about and saying well this is only a couple of the sculptures that were in place. Uh, they have not been placed yet. I think they're still deciding about location for some of them. Um, so this is just a generalized shot of three of the seven pieces that were done, but we'll we'll go through some of the other ones. Actually, that's your horse in the foreground, Kevin. And so, those are your flowers in the background on the left. Yeah. And Ted and did, uh, Ted's elk and Ted's is on elk. the right. I think we'll show some larger ones of those a little bit later on in the, in, the, in our viewing. Well, sculpture, can I just say, sculpture is always a difficult thing to photograph because, of course, you it needs to work from every angle. So, really, you should have a photograph from every angle, which, of course, you can't do. And in <laughs> this case, uh, 
my horse in the front is about six feet tall at the tallest part, while I think Ted's elk uh, at the tip of the antlers is taller than that. But in this photo, it looks like it's a lot smaller because it's farther back. Same thing with your flowers. I mean, how how high are they? Nine feet or eight feet? They're way the up top there. One is 13 oh, yeah, feet. we get an, an illusion from the photo. Yeah, the top one is 13 feet tall. So, yeah. 13 feet, wow. Yeah, it's 13 feet high, that one. The Magic 13, yes. Uh, yeah, Ted's is quite a quite a large piece of the elk. We'll show some of that. It's, it's something that's quite beautiful as to how these things so now when we are working together a lot of times you know you're like you said you're helping each other i mean i couldn't lift that after a while my my arms got tired lifting that large uh, flower up and down up and down till i got it corrected and secured and so you need help from people uh we had hired a uh, a gentleman to help us um throughout the symposia uh, and he kind of went around and helped everybody a little bit. And I think we're, we're really uh, grateful that we did that because we all uh, chipped in and made it so that we believe that everybody should be paid. I think that's really what it comes down to as well. And uh, I think everybody did get a little stimpin. You know, I mean, we're, we didn't make a fortune doing these things. Cause like you said, we I don't know how many trips we each made back and forth between the cities uh you know just our gas and fuel bills and uh support of the local community whether you're at their restaurants or you're you know doing those things so it, it works both ways and actually we've had a number of restaurant people come out to look at the what we did on a regular basis so some of our sponsors and they brought their kids and family with them as well so now this was an interesting piece i mean this is a glyph that was created. I think understanding that a lot of times this was supposed to be funded and it was part of our a grant submission that we did not get. Um, and we had to go down a different road. You don't get everything you ask for. And so you always have to say, we're still going to do it, but we just got to figure out how we're going to do it. And fortunately um, the community was able to secure a grant so we could pay for the concrete and, and get all the structures done but this was a collaborative piece with the high school students grade 11 and grade 12 students in their art class and uh i really want to thank lee lee fuller who's one of our members um for orchestrating this this was one of his dreams that he has been working on for a number of years wanting to do this and uh can you speak to this a little bit a bit about the glyph the, your 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 thoughts on it well, the glyph was a, an interesting project. What Lee wa wanted to do was somehow collaborate with the community on a, on a large piece of sculpture. And it's a difficult thing for somebody to just sort of parachute in who's never done sculpture and, and to try to contribute to a big piece. So you can't really expect that. So what Lee did was he approached the high school and, and notably the high school art teacher to ask if the students would create small sculptural pieces that could then be incorporated into the glyph. So this is what you see on the surface of the glyph. Each one of those indentations is a student work. And, you know, they are various subjects. It, it's whatever the students decided they wanted to show as their mark. It's like the ancient petro petroglyphs, whoever, put those in, put in to show who they were and how they lived. And I think this glyph shows that just in a modern context. So the students did all of the uh, small pieces in plaster. Some were in, uh, done in, oh, shoot, what was it we cast in, Paul? Um, anyways, the different pieces we had to touch them up a little bit so that they would fit then you can see on the right hand side there is a wooden form there and inside the wooden form we glued the plaster sculptures of the students then <clears throat> put the form together then a cement truck came in filled it up and after four days we pulled off the mold we had some problems with the 
student pieces coming away from the walls of the mold. So we had to take those out kind of one at a time, but they came out nicely. Then after that, we cleaned it up. And uh, another uh, concrete worker came in and did that nice smooth surface for us on the top. He kind of appeared out of nowhere and volunteered. And I was thinking that we probably had 30 different people working on this piece and this piece is going to last a long time it's concrete and no one will be moving it there's rebar <laughs> reinforcement in it it was done very very nicely and i'm sure when the students show up in september they're going to be very glad to see their work the only problem we had was that none of the students were there on the day that we unveiled it and that would have been nice but uh, they'll be yeah. back in september and uh, they'll see it it's right in front of their school yeah, things just appear over the summer. Oof, there they are. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's nice to have their involvement. I think um, uh, Lee had mentioned that actually one of the mother or mother and one of the ch uh, children that had worked on here, oh, a young girl, I won't say children, and she had produced a piece of work. Um, and she saw it in there and she was, you know, was very, very drawn to it. And she was telling the story about it that, it was uh, a symbol of a bear and that she had put in there and she had done that for her grandmother. Well, her grandmother had just passed away on July 1st. And so it means something really special to her that she actually had a piece of her grandmother placed in this uh, in glyph. So I'm going to be, be interesting to hear the story from each of the children as the, that had worked on it at the time as to how they feel about it in a year's time, you know, about being a part of this. I think there's a also a space for another one in a, in another year somewhere down the road. They might be able to put one in one of the other medians there that could be worked on. It's a lot of work, <laughs> and I uh, you know we really naively went into this thing thinking, oh well, this will be just a cakewalk. You know, we'll just stick those things on and everything will just pour the cement. Not so, right? I think there's a really understanding that. Kids really under, need to know that, you know, with the undercut that can happen with a, a mold and you've got to keep everything so that it can pop off cleanly. So you got to, the detail surprisingly was kept, you know, some stuff had, had quite a bit of detail in them. And it, it, it actually uh, uh, showed up quite good. I was quite surprised that it didn't just fill in, you know, just in, in, in kind of muddied water, just book, you know, fill in the whole thing. But uh, I think generally, I think it was, it'd be quite well received. And uh, I would thank everybody who was involved in that for sure. And like you said, there was quite a few people involved in it, realizing that we didn't put enough of a release on that plaster for it to release from. So we're in the learning stage as well as what we should have been using more so than, but it still worked. And we had to pick the plaster out and that was fine and pressure washered it and it, it all worked good. So now we just get into a bit of some of the sculpture that was done here. Uh, the one is uh, on the left here is uh, a goose. Um, it's quite large, um, done by James Corpin. Um, it's on the evening of the finale. And I thought the light looked just pretty nice. It just, he, he works in, uh, in metal, welded steel, and he loves the, the look of... Uh, that rusted texture and he keeps, he'll come and coat it with a couple of special mixture of coatings that he has that encourages uh, permanence and it gets a nice patina built up on it. Can you talk about Lori, Lori um, has a piece on the right. Can you talk a little bit about Lori's piece of work there? I, I love the rings. Well, I'll, I'll talk about both a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Lori's piece uh, is made from the steel tires from the old horse and wagon. So he has, I think three of those are actual tires. There are two others that <clears throat> are some different kind of wheel. I'm not exactly sure. It, what actually, they are. Uh, it actually came out of yeah. a tractor wheel that was cut back. Uh, oh, was that a rim. What it, was? it was a tractor okay. rim, a tire rim from a large tractor. So wagon wheels and tractor tire rims. Uh, yes. And he's been saving these for a long time. He had a collection of chains, big, thick chains that are as thick around as your wrist. And he has some chain tensioners built in there, some of those uh, 
uh, orange pieces. He has giant hooks. And uh, now I, I hate to paraphrase this because Laurie had the best explanation on why his piece was uh, it symbolized life and, and the meaning of life. And he talked about life being circular because everything comes back around. So the circles in this symbolize that we're chained to our jobs, we're chained to our life, we're chained to the people around us. So the chains uh, symbolize that. There's lots of little hooks that uh, come in in our life. I, I guess some of them are good and some of them are bad. Uh, so he has hooks to symbolize that. And of course, the tensioners uh, are always changing the tension on those chains. So I thought it was quite an interesting one. Now, I think this is about eight feet tall, is it? Or maybe it's um, more like seven. I know Jim's piece, yeah. the bird on the left, is nine feet from the ground to the tip of the beak. And yeah. I think Lori's piece is just a little bit under that. Yeah. Very nicely it. done. And I think six people could stand on it and it would be just fine. It's, it's beautifully engineered and has a really nice flow to it. It's actually built as a spring steel on the bottom. And so the spring steel, really strong. And I, I, I saw him testing it. He's jumping on it. He's like a like a jumping beam. He was jumping on it, just testing the welds and the and it still had flexibility, but it wasn't 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 breaking at all. So it was all tested out really well. Yeah. It was a, I like the piece and you sit back at, and at night. The light hit it, and you could those rings all just kept circling. You could they catch the edges, right? And you just get a really nice, a nice feeling. These things kind of spiraling up and spiraling down, right? They just have a nice feeling to them. I was I was always wondering how he was going to stack these things and get them to look. Um, I remember looking at the maquettes, and we talked about understanding that when when you put this presentation together, um, to get the trust of our I'll call him our client. <clears throat> Excuse me. You had to tell them, what are you going to do? Like, what are you going to make? Well, just trust us? No. He said, well, we should show them what we're going to do. So we all kind of made a little maquettes and we or drawings, and they were submitted, and people could they could say, Oh, yeah, yeah, like okay, that that'll work, that'll work. And I think we all kind of worked with each other about the engineering of things to make sure that we're, we're talking about public sculpture here. So things uh, can be climbed on and you know you never know what's going to happen uh, you try to minimize um, things that could happen but I think the community embraced it quite a bit they wanted to see diverse and we're seeing very diverse sculpture here quite a bit of it's quite different anyway you're going to talk about James Corpin's piece the, the goose a little bit well, Jim's piece, uh, is a really interesting piece. Jim is the guy who first got me working in straight steel for my large sculptures. And, and I was kind of inspired by what he does. Now, these pieces are the uh, flat pieces of metal where shapes are cut out of the flat piece through a, probably a hydrojet process. They're called, and, a skeleton. they're called skeletons when they're done. Yeah. Skeletons, and, and they're, they're the leftovers. So the left. industry takes out all the pieces they need, and they have this big skeleton that was probably a four by eight sheet of metal, and then they're all the negative uh, shapes. So he takes those and then cuts them into the shapes that will work for his piece and then puts them together in a sort of realist abstract kind of a method. He, some of it is quite abstract, but it's all based in nature. It's all based in realism. You look at it, you know exactly. You're looking at a Canada goose, there's no doubt, even though they're, you know, it's done in an abstract way. And to me, uh, I kind of learn a little bit from Jim each time because it's not only what he does in the sculpture, but it's what he doesn't do. He makes sure that he doesn't overwork it. Like you look at the head on this piece. He's left that almost as a two-dimensional line drawing done in steel. Yet yeah. other parts are more three-dimensional. And, and this will be done for a reason and done on purpose. And Jim has been doing this kind of work for many, many years. 
we were lucky enough to go out and see a piece of his that was 40 years old. And it, it had some similarities in approach to this piece. So he's been doing this a long time, and that's why he's able to do it so effectively. Yeah, this and this goose has got some symbolism to it. Um, uh, it's 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 a sister goose that he did. Um, I think 2015 or somewhere in there in uh, in um, Valdivia, Chile, and he did a Canada goose there facing north, and this goose will be facing south. So, Valdivia and Martinsville are now becoming uh, sister cities between the two geese so canada geese going north canada geese going south so that was what he had told me and uh, some of the symbolism that goes into that piece of work so location becomes and direction becomes quite important i was talking to the committee uh, person the other day and this one will be put near one of the ponds and in the grassland area uh, and they were asking about position i said face it south <laughs> this this one I thought is, is Ted Yushin's work. Um, I've never seen a guy work so hard in all my life uh, with a deadline. I mean, you work pretty hard too. I mean, I was pretty amazed with that. But Ted, Ted's, Ted's a young guy. And uh, those antlers each weigh about 100 pounds, 90 pounds, I think, something like that, uh, to try to get him up. The base alone, just the bottom of the elk, 650 pounds just for just that ring on the bottom. So a lot of weight. Um, so this is the evening shot. And this is one of the day shots over here on the right, uh, two different profiles. But you can see, I, I, is this called a steampunk style, I guess, where you're taking um, pieces of metal and rings and things and building your shapes from? I think that's what you'd uh, call it, a I'd steampunk it. Uh, style. Yeah. Uh, this one is is based in realism, too. I mean, it's so obvious it's an elk and, and really beautiful, uh, beautifully rendered. The antlers, uh, you know, done with, with pieces of solid rod that are, I don't know how big they It's more than two-inch rod, isn't it? Some of those. Well, I think uh, they were some of them uh, angle, or they were axles of some kind, were they not? Or spindles, I think. Yeah, before. and he would have to heat them with a torch to bend them. He then did. every weld, he grinds and re-welds and grinds and re-welds and shines it all up. Uh, there was somebody asking me if they were cast, you know, because in a bronze, you cast everything in one piece and you get those beautiful seams. Well, Ted just does all of that with his welder and his grinder. So really nicely finished. And then the ideas that he has for each little piece that goes in and becomes part of the piece. I, I'm always amazed at people who do that. Jim Corpin does the same thing. He can take odd objects and then put them together to realize his own vision. And, and Ted was very much able to do that. And it was really nice to see him do a large piece. Ted always has really good work, but I haven't seen anything he's done on this scale. And yeah, talking about working, I would arrive at the site every morning at 8.30. There's Ted waiting for me. I would leave every night about 8 o'clock. There's Ted still over there welding. You know, so gee whiz, he was there earlier and left later mm -hmm. every day. But you have to put in a lot of hours if you're doing this style of work. You know, it's it's a beautiful piece, and this is really strong, really nice. I, yeah, done. I think I think this is about opportunity as well. You want it to happen. Unfortunately, you have a deadline. Um, you know, just there's a point it has to end. But you'd love to spend more and more time. I know he kept going back and forth. I got to do this and change and add this and do that. And at the point, he said, "You know what? I have to go home and have a sleep, <laughs> and and come back the next day." I think he was actually working some shift work and, and being between it all. So, uh, all our shifts. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're, you know, this is kind of the commitment you get from an artist that, you know, is someone has still working full time. Some of these people and they take their holidays or they take, they make uh, adjustments in their life so they can do a major piece every couple of years. They can actually work on something that 
been stewing in them for quite a while. I'm figuring out, I mean, he couldn't have done a lot of this without the help of some people lifting. I mean, he's quite strong, but to sit and lift an antler up into place while it's being welded into place, you need help for that. Um, and that the symposium does offer that, that opportunity. And I think uh, he had quite a following from the time he started. And I think we'll show a couple of shots of that. The, the people that followed him over the two weeks, they'd, they come every day with their kids even, and they'd look and they'd see, oh, my, and he just added that to it. they come back the next day and they'd see how it progressed. Normally, you don't get to see how an artist works. And I think that's what it's, the symposium, it opens this open studio feeling. People can come and go. As, as you're there, they come and watch and talk and talk about art. And it's about education as well in a, in a very informal way. Uh, just curiosity and interest, I think, by general public that maybe do no art at all. Um, you may be inspiring some young kid or artist down the road to say, oh, I remember going to that and seeing that elk and being inspired by that. And that's the joy of some of this thing. What do you think on, on some of that? Is it, am I somewhat correct? Well, it worked for me. Uh, I remember going to see uh, Prairie Sculptors Association uh, Sculpture Symposium by the Mendel Art Gallery many, many, many years ago. And I was, you know, busy drawing and painting and I was teaching classes all over the place and really was not a member of PSA at that point and wasn't doing as much sculpture as i would like to do i it was always a, my uh, my minor in art college was sculpture drawing and painting was my major sculpture would have been my minor but i wasn't <clears throat> getting enough opportunity to do it so i went to a symposium and i started to see the scale of the works and everybody working together and and i thought i need to do that and it took several years for me to uh to you know decide to make the commitment to join the association and then after that more time to uh to come into these symposiums but i'm really glad i did it because what i see it as is an opportunity to give myself the uh, i don't know the the boot in the uh, to get myself working on a big piece <laughs> and not uh quit just start on it go hard till it's done and supposedly have forced me to do that. And that way I work bigger than I normally would, stronger than I normally would, and have a good time with all my artist friends. It's really good. I think one of the things we have in our group, you were talking about the eclectic quality of the of the the sculptures. Like everybody's working totally different styles. And I think it's because we let each person have their own autonomy. No one comes in and is teaching a class or anything. We don't feel we have to conform to a standard. Everybody does what they do, but we just want them to do it well. And we want it to be strong enough to be in, in the public domain. And we're ready to help each other do that. And, and it's really worked. So just seeing this symposium got me doing symposiums years later and i can't be the only one i think yeah. a lot of people go through and they're inspired by what they see yeah and I, I see a lot of other people i think we've got a couple of maybe potentially new members coming out because they came out to see what we're doing um and these people you know they've had other jobs and trades and they're they're a, quite a very age i mean the psa has been around since what 1983 i think started with bill app uh, and his uh, students, I think it's about. Well, I think that's about what it is, 1982 or 83. Yeah, but so there right. are conflicting opinions because Jim Corpin said that the first sculpture symposium was 1968. But at that point, there was no Prairie Sculptors Association. I think the association started in the 80s. And okay. now uh, it's new members for the most yeah. part. There are a couple of original members but it's, yeah. it's mainly new people. So the association has continued continued to attract sculptors. And we, of course, have shows together. You know, as you know, Paul, we, we've had uh, uh, two shows so far this year. We have another coming up in the fall, plus the symposium. It's been a very busy year for us. 
but I think it's it's really good for sculptors to uh, to get together and and to work together. Yeah, understanding Maybe a lot of that. A lot of uh, our, sh our shows are, you know, middle size pieces and smaller pieces. So we have a number of our members that just produce work in small stone, uh, carvings, uh, wood, um, small welded steel. They don't do monumental large pieces. They, they feel comfortable uh, tabletop size types of work, whether you're uh, carving a piece of soapstone or whatever. So... I encourage people to go to prairiesculptors.com and you can see some of the things that some of our members are doing. Um, this this showing here, I mean, it, it's a, a collage of a number of our artists and we do have female artists as well and sculptors in our group. And, uh, you know, we have Sandy here. I, I've shown her. She can, can you tell us a little bit about these screens that she built? Where'd she get those from? Uh, these are... Uh big plexiglass uh, screens that were originally uh, splash guards during COVID. Oh, you know, the setup between they're, the they're, cashier they're, they're, and the customer. They're quite and, thick. And uh, they're thick. Yeah, they're they're half an inch or more. Yeah. Might even be five eighths. So they're good and strong. And uh, at the end of COVID, when these were taken out of a business, somebody asked uh, Sandy if she wanted them. And she said, oh, sure, I'll do a mosaic on it. Well, they've been kicking around for quite a few years. And then when the symposium came up, she had the idea for these pieces. Now, one of the things with uh, mosaic and, and specifically these large mosaics, they're four feet tall. Each one of these is four feet tall. So it takes a lot of time to do all of this. So she got two sides done. She's going to do all four sides. And the one on the right, it would be the barn window. And kids might be able to go around to the back and look out through the window and mom will take their picture. Underneath that, unfortunately, it doesn't show real well in the picture. But underneath, the, the bottom two window frames are actually done with small little mirror tiles. And each one is placed at a slightly different angle so that as you walk along, some of the mirrors catch reflections and some don't. So it kind of sparkles. So that works real well. And then her plan for the other side is to do the front end of a Volkswagen van so that the kids will be looking out of the window of the van. <laughs> now, on the left is the cow. The cow uh, is pretty well complete. There's one flower she has complete, but the rest of the negative space is going to be full of sunflowers. So it's going to be a cow in a field of sunflowers. And then on the other side, she's going to uh, a more design oriented uh, approach. She's going to have some, some uh, mandala type circles. She's going to have some paisley shapes and, and who knows what else. I think that that's the one where she's going wild and abstract. <laughs> I just like this you said, one, though, it, at this point is unfinished, so she's had to take them back to the studio. She'll finish them, then take them back to the community. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm showing the diversity of our of our members. I mean, down on the bottom left, you see Lori uh, Afseth working on those circle rings, and uh, there's been in the middle James Corpin. Actually, an early early shot. Uh, just looking at the iron that <laughs> on, on, a, on a table before he builds the goose. He's trying to build a body for that. And uh, Ray Keeley on the right, who's carving a wolf, who actually uh, uh, was part of the symposium, but you know, he's, he's a member and he just brought and decided he's going to start carving with us throughout the weeks. And it was great. He had a great response from uh, people. Uh, they they love seeing the progress, especially in wood, you can move it fairly quickly. And pretty soon the people say, is that, oh, it's a wolf. Then I think he added a little cub, uh, a, a little wolf here um, later on. This is an early stage one. But, yeah, it was uh, well received. Oh, Ray now, was interesting because he said all the way through, oh, no, I won't have time to be part of the symposium. Oh, I can't do that. I'm too busy. But once we were all set up, he just saw all the action and, and just couldn't stand it. So he went and got this 
huge <laughs> piece of wood, which I tried to help him put into his truck. I mean, we got it in, but it's heavy. Anyway, he brought it and he was there every day carving. So for a guy who wasn't part of the symposium, he put <laughs> in more hours than most of us. So very interesting. And Ray is a, a pretty successful artist who's been around for a lot of years. And and whatever he does turns out really well. He he does a lot of painting and a lot of sculpture and, and just great to work with. And it was interesting watching him working on a carving to me, a carving is the, the whole thought process that goes into a carving is just backwards for me. And I can't think that way. So I, I always look at carvers with envy and, and how do they do that? And yeah. him, though, he just keeps going until he finds what he wants. Yeah, it's very subtractive. And you you are very additive in, in your right. uh, <clears throat> process. So another couple of pieces here. Um, Ellery Russell on the left, who did this uh, abstracted, I'll call it, wow. it was made of cloud, made out of, it was multicolored and uh, made out of um, rod, iron, like iron rod. It was, the project is, steel rod. it's steel rod and it, it, it's an overwhelming project. I mean, to see it, it's so different than all the other conformed sculpture that has a defined shape. This cloud is different. It's just, it's trying to accept different sculpture, like really accept it for what it is. And you have to step back from it and open your mind up and say, how does she see this? Where does this go? Uh, this is supposed to be elevated when it's, it, it's complete except it needs to be elevated um, eight or ten feet in the air. Um, you're expected to be able to lay down and look up and see the birds in the clouds. And she's got some uh, laser cut birds that she's put in into place that are suspended from the cloud. So kind of a different concept, more of an interpretive but um, uh, immersive. Like it's meant for you to be a part of, just like. Uh, Lee Fuller's, um, I guess it's kind of a little uh, contained space. He calls it the hug. It's a place to get away from things and sit and meditate and do something on your own. So again, it's more of an immersive thing. You have being involved physically in it. Where the other ones are step back and look at it, this one is get inside it and look at it. What is your response to these two pieces? Well, first of all, you were talking about Lee's piece, and, and I quite enjoy it. If you go in and stand in there, I'm not sure. You can probably just look over the the highest point. So uh, I don't know how tall this is. Is it six feet tall? Maybe about it six must feet be about tall. that. About six but feet. what I noticed about it, when you do go in and you sit on that nice platform he's got at the bottom, there's a uh, the acoustics in there are really affected by the wooden uprights. So if you go in and you know do a little hum or your uh, mantra or whatever it is you want to do, you can feel the wood vibrating. It was kind of funny because uh, yesterday we had a visit from a, a very great musician, and so I was telling him about the acoustics and it, oh yes, you've got to go in there and try the acoustics. So he just went in, he's about to try the acoustics and the diesel motor started up in the generator right beside him. So I guess he didn't get to try them. But once it moves to a quiet place, I think people are going to enjoy that. And I think kids are gonna love it. You know, it, it, to me, it's, it, it is a sculpture, it's a modernist piece, but it's something that can be interactive, that, that kids can go in, they can make a little fort, they can play house, they can do whatever they want. And it's a good, strong piece too. It, it won't be falling apart anytime soon. Yeah, it's, it's solid, uh, rough timber um, and yeah. sanded a little bit. So yeah. it's a full two now, inches. Ellery's piece, can I talk a bit about it? Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. Ellery's piece, what I really enjoyed, and, and we only see one of the birds here. The birds were really interesting. She cut those out of flat, well, this one, out of flat steel with uh, a plasma cutter. And she had some others. Oh, there is one. 
uh, just on the left hand side there, you can just see it curved, it's hanging down. Those birds were cut out of a round piece of pipe and she cut them out with a plasma cutter and then got these birds in flight. So very interesting stuff. And then some of these old horseshoes she's used, she said they actually were from her dad's horses. So these are horses that, that have some importance to her. And then, you know, working with movement and, and uh, just carrying the eye in different ways with her uh, uh, curved pieces of, uh, of steel rod. And the steel rod's very, uh, very strong. And Ellery also is uh, a finisher too. Like she won't let a weld show she's in there. She grinds it all smooth and has everything looking really nice. I think she and Ted were working side by side and they're both like that. They finish <laughs> every weld, they polish everything and it ends up looking really nice. And in this case, she needed that nice smooth texture because when she brings the color in, then you can really get the effect of the color. Right. And she, uh, these were all painted with auto paint. So yeah. they'll last and last. And there's a couple more. There's you working on uh, right there, early stages of your horse. So, early stages well here's an early stage you don't have a line drawing basically of your horse on the right there well here. people I were asking when they saw the finished piece they say how do you start and <laughs> uh, i don't know i i guess it's just uh starting with basically a sawhorse and then just keep adding pieces till it looks like a real horse right yeah for sure and ted's there there's ted he's got a apron put around the base because of all the weld that drops off didn't want it to uh, tarnish anything that he had already completed on the bottom when he's working on the elk he had just got the antlers set on there and he was working on uh, adding more pieces to uh to the body on that and there's some of my sculpture in the middle um i, I work with the uh um uh, recycled car parts and fenders and bumpers and i kind of create uh uh, this one was called a, a monomer bouquet, which is a, a plastic presence. It's sort of an environmental response. Um, a lot of these bumpers were actually destined for uh, disposal in our landfill. So, uh, I mean, they do crunch them up and send them to the States as well. But initially, they were a lot of plastic in our soils. So I thought, well, what else grows from a soil if you got lots of plastic but plastic flowers? So. So these were actually made from everything, so right from a bumper. So you literally have to cut them apart, and it was like filleting a fish at times uh, to create these, and then you restructure them so they can stand tall. The middle one's about 13 feet high, and the other ones are about eight, eight or nine feet. So it's just a, a nice colorful collection of, of pieces. To The pipe is actually from uh, chain link fencing, and... Uh, I was very fortunate to have a sponsor, uh, Nordic Fence, that uh, they gave me a 32-foot gate that they cut apart for me, and they gave me some long pieces to work with. And uh, so my costs were mostly just my time. So it was it was great to have uh, a full piece that was made with recycled materials. So that was kind of a it was a fun project, and it's you never really see it until you put the paint on it, and when the paint just you paint her up and she uh, she just pops and looks kind of fun. I noticed in uh, the finale, a lot of the kids were getting their pictures taken in front of in front of it and different things. And that makes me feel good when kids can really embrace. When you walk, when you stand underneath a 13-foot flower, even as an adult, I think it it brings you back to your childhood a little bit. You know, it just gives you a little bit of that fun back in your life. And that's sort of where this is about in my, in my piece. Yeah. Do you have some comments on any of the things here? That well, just talking about your piece, Paul. What uh, I think your real skill is here. I mean, there's a lot of skill that's shown, but the real skill is to be able to suggest the flower, uh, create the flower, make me see more than you're actually giving me, because you're doing this with just the amount of plastic that you need. You know, none. It, I I don't want to say it's minimalism, although there's a minimalist approach. You're you're very uh, careful in what you put in and and careful with what you don't put in. 
So I think the designs are really good. And, and design is such an important part of element and, uh, or of, of any art. You know, it's a, a really important thing. And you have a lot of experience with this and it shows. And to be able to take something that's a fairly simple form that just speaks volumes and you've been able to do that. I'm looking at the photo here, though, on my computer, and, and I'm a little sad that the colors are not as bright as they really are when you see it outside, because your colors are just bright and strong. And, and in the photo, there you, you don't really get as much of a, a feel of, of the color, you know. I think also what I like to do was to go and just kind of stand in the middle of the flowers and look up. And I noticed the kids doing that, sort of walking around and in between and and really, really enjoying it. It's kind of Alice in Wonderland, like you kind of yeah. you know, you get it like that. But, you know, symposiums, like the one in Manitou we had two years ago, I was able to use that as my R&D to develop how was I going to create these pieces. So that was the early two years ago. I was just, how do you bend and fold and twist and, and move? And what can you create from a bumper and a fender to, to create it? something else because the people come they don't know what it's made out of other than they see this great big pile of inventory that i have behind me most of the time bumpers to work from they go how do you make that from that so that that makes it feel good when you can't figure out where it came from the substrate you figure you you've you've made it especially in recycled materials you know, where ted's you can sort of look at well that gear is from a certain type of tractor and that one was from so and so and, and different things Yet auto body guys will come and look at this and they'll they'll say uh, they'll know what kind of car that came from or where that part came from. Anyway, they're kind of fun. You got to kind of move along. So we, you know, at, at the end of everything, you, know, you like a little bit of celebration. You I mean, you've worked hard for 10, 12 days building a piece. Uh, you invite the community back to celebrate the event. And we hired actually a professional company to uh, produce our program for us, um, Roadside Attractions and, and uh, Jim Hodges. And he did a great job of putting together, I guess and I'll call it here, a multicultural event um, that you would not get anywhere else at any one time to put this together. And these people, the, the dancing that went on, I mean, we got the picture, College 9, good Lord, those guys have been around since the 20s, not these specific guys, but uh, you know, they come in and uh, put on a great performance, great dancing. You get some comments on some of the things that happened that evening, some some things that caught your eye? Well, sure. I've always been a, a fan of, of dance and dance performance. And it was it was very eclectic. I, the Spanish group is here and they had live musicians playing behind them. And uh, I saw the spanish dancers going around to each piece you know an hour or so before the performance a couple of hours before and going to each piece and it was interesting when she went up to my horse the first thing she did was this with her hand you know which is kind of what the horse is doing and so she was doing that with each piece kind of making up the choreography sort of uh, so that it will be informed by the pieces. I'm not saying that they did a, a specific dance for each one, but each dance was informed by the piece, which I thought was really good. There was a Ukrainian dance group, uh, group you know, of, of younger dancers, and they were just a bundle of energy. Absolutely amazing. And the, these two gals in white with their gymnastics were just really good. And I, they seem to me to be more like, I don't know what, what their style would be, whether it's modern dance or whether it's lyrical or whether it's a fusion of the two, but a little bit more uh, a sort of esoteric style of dance. And then, uh, uh, well, the College Nine, they're, uh, they're quite esoteric, of course. They're, they're quite a band. You know, they're, some people would call them a comedy band, and, and you look at the costumes, you might think so but they are superb musicians, each and every one, you know, who yeah. have a, a long history uh, in music. And then they get together as the College Nine. It's the only band that has never, ever had a rehearsal. They just play. 
they just get together. Okay, we've got a gig. We're going up to a sculpture symposium. They all get together and they show up and da 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 and, and you know play a a wonderful performance. So we were very fortunate to uh, to have a connection there where we were able to uh, to get them to come into the performance. The I other think- one was um, was it. Uh, Joseph Desjardins was that the name of the uh, the fiddler and Kathy Sproul on keyboard? They played a beautiful uh, little uh, concert, I guess. For Intro, yeah. it must have been forty five minutes or an hour before it all started. So we had such a mix of of performance art to go with the visual art, and yeah. people spent a lot of time going around looking at the sculptures. And then, of course, to to mix a little bit of performance art, kind of a multimedia art extravaganza is what it ended up being. And some might say it was a good party. It probably was. And we we had a fairly good turnout. It's it's a tall order to get any kind of a turnout on an August weekend when the weather is beautiful and everyone's at the lake. But still, we had a really good crowd. And I think uh, a good time was had by all. Yeah, it was a good. It was a good family entertainment thing as well, and I think. Uh, but I really like the fact that we we tell artists to encourage other artists, visual artists. They said, when you critique somebody, be kind when you do something, but speak up and speak on behalf of them. But we forget that we have all these other art forms that need that same kind of support. And if you put on a venue like that, like we did. Bring in those other, the dancers, the musicians, the things that said we can all celebrate together. Um, and I think, and, and all these artists were paid. So I, I really want to make sure that these, the you know, understanding that we put the funding together to do this. And thank you to Martinsville for helping us do that. I mean, that that is really important. It's not just about us. It really is about the community. And here's some of the... Some of the staff, they were serving some of the food that we had uh, at the entrance, and uh, it was much, much appreciated. There's nothing I like better than smelling of food and music and dance and sculpture all in the same venue. It's kind of a, it's, it's, uh, it, it kind of livens things up when you have all the, you've added that smell as well to the flavor of the night. Yeah. And snacks. You say snap. Uh, a staff, none of those were staff. Every one no, of the, these people yeah. are volunteers. Volunteers. And they yeah. came out to help us. Uh, they knew that, uh, you know, we wanted to make it a successful event. So they came out, set up this little barbecue stand, and and it was really great. But volunteer labor in this part and from the community. Right. And I do want to mention that, uh, you know, we really appreciated Jamie Martins and uh, she's the. Uh, uh, what is her stat? Her mayor. She's deputy the mayor. she's the deputy mayor who really stepped up to the plate and helped us really put this on. We had people coming in daily, giving us coffee and bringing us muffins and food and feeding us and making us feel good. So that's really a nice uh, part of the community. And make sure we had enough water because we needed to hydrate. It was hot, hot, hot uh, while we were working. Uh, and uh, we really want to say thank you to a lot of those people. This is just, uh, I had to put this up to say this, the thank you to the poster that went out for the finale, but all the people that were involved, uh, the sponsors are on this sheet as well for our little bit of a disclaimer. Um, now, what was the event with this uh, this little girl with the light? That was the, what was that program? The Witches? Uh, well, this was uh, kind of the wizard with the light. It made me think of the old Led Zeppelin album cover where they have the wizard with the light. And now isn't that out of the tarot cards? It's it's one Great. of the characters out of the tarot. But anyway, the wizard came out and went around to each of the sculptures with the light. And then there were three dancer performers behind her and I don't know, they were playing, I don't know if it's a game, but it's like the old game, uh, the Brits call it British Bulldog, and we call it red light, green light, where as long as the principal person is looking away, the other people can move at will. And they were, these three dancers were doing the weirdest stuff. And as soon as she turned to look, they would all stop. 
So yeah. it was kind of like red light, green light. So it was very interesting to watch them go around it. You know, the guys behind are doing their antics and they were in these strange metallic costumes that uh, I know our producer was saying those costumes, they went way over the top with the costumes. They spent all this time making these wonderful costumes. Yeah. And then at the uh, once they had gone around to each piece with the lantern, then the three dancers uh, did a performance. And it was really interesting because it was... I don't know, would you call it hip hop dance? Would you call it break dance? I think it's a combination of the two. But then we also had, you know, a, a, a belly dance, uh, a troupe mm -hmm. that's doing ancient dances that go back 5,000 years. And then we've got hip hop and break dance and everything in between. So I thought that was interesting. And it speaks to the eclectic quality of the artwork too because we have some more traditional styles and we have some more modern styles and that was reflected in the dance yeah let me just kind of end it on this one i just i just there's our photographer we actually had uh, john Perret uh photograph and videotape throughout our symposium and there will be a video available one day uh, we'll get her all edited and put together for this event. But uh, I do encourage uh, anybody who wants to reach out to the Prairie Sculptors, just come through our website, prairiesculptors.com. And uh, we had a, I, I think we've pretty well covered it. I mean, I had a great time. I was tired, but it was my rest. But now I have to have a regular work to be a rest from that work. So I was just <laughs> It's good to change pace, and it was a, a great opportunity to produce some larger work. And uh, I was tired on day two. It's uh, <laughs> I kept reminding myself it's a marathon, not a sprint. Keep going, <laughs> keep going, because when you try and do all that in two weeks, it's physically very demanding, but it's worth it. That's the one nice thing I didn't, yeah, the one, the one thing I didn't mention is that in this symposium, uh, the work stays in the community for three years as part of our agreement, make sure when you do these things that you have a contract uh, with the community so everybody knows what is expected uh, during and at the conclusion of it. And so the community now is going to choose which ones they want, where they want to put it, the location. So I guess the locations are going to be somewhat spread out, not all in one space right now. So it'd be relative to the sculpture as to where it goes so they still have a question mark about where they're gonna put your horse maybe they should put it out by the horse racing track or somewhere i think if only they had a horse racing track i know they'll be, so be in good. front of the hockey arena i know it <laughs> yeah that's right they can practice shooting pucks at it it's uh it's pretty strong i don't think that horse will be breaking anytime soon i don't know what do how think, many pieces of steel i think the horse should be here where I live, because you know, actually, that's the proper place for it. Number yeah, one, well, I put and uh, wheels on them and drag them down there on our there car. There you go. We have, we have got Nunzio and Rocco, they can come up from the city and they'll bring the horse. It'll be <laughs> nice. good for, very good. Sounds good to me. There yeah. you go, gentlemen. This was wonderful and fascinating, and hopefully, all the fans enjoyed it as well. Don't forget to leave your comments below, and we'll have the links to the symposium below as well, um, as well as a definition for the people that came in late. So they'll know what a symposium is. Um, yeah. And then we'll go from there. And don't forget to subscribe and like, and we'll see everybody next week. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Have a great day. You have a great week. Cheers, everybody.